So for 17 years I've been living in our room. Um, all that time I thought, uh, well, I may be the only Irish person living here, I mean only American living here who doesn't have Irish ancestors. And I said that one day to um, a friend of mine who I play golf with once a week uh, named Tony Bolin. His brother has one brother who is the bishop in Kansas City and another who is the bishop of the uh, Catholic Diocese here in, in Savannah, uh, Kevin Bolin. And I said, Tony, I, I may be the only American here who doesn't have Irish ancestors. And his comment was, you just haven't looked hard enough. <laughs> and sure enough, I looked and found some O'Connors who lived in Galway in about 1730, uh, who had a daughter who married uh, a Scot, and they moved back to Scotland, and those were my mother's ancestors. So uh, I did find an Irish ancestor. And to sort of verify that, um, for the book signings that I'm doing in Ireland, um, I tried, was trying to get some reviews done and um, talked with the editor of a journal called Irish Books. And he was very excited about it because he had sailed on a Liberty ship as a child. He had been in London during the war, had been evacuated to Australia, and came back to, uh, to London uh, on a Liberty ship. But he said, you know, we only review books uh, about Ireland and by Irish authors. And then he said, but you've been here 17 years, so that's, that makes you qualified. Uh, so th that's my legitimacy, I guess, in Ireland. And uh, um, I would hope that um, somebody might uh, contact the Hibernians and tell them that I am now eligible to be Grand Marshal of the St. Patrick's Day Parade. <laughs> St. Patrick's Day Parade, you have something here on St. Patrick's Day that we do not have in Ireland, and that's Irish elected officials. <laughs> they all depart and come here with their families, their friends, their close relatives, their extended family, uh, their staff, their pets, all at uh, the expense of the Irish taxpayer. So uh, in some cases it, it's, it's a week that things get done in Ireland when they're over here. Uh, so uh, uh, the book uh, people have asked me, well, why did you get interested in a topic like this? You worked with animals and children most of your career, and um, uh, why did this become an interest? I think sometimes they were asking, really, what makes you think that you're a maritime historian? And I guess there's nothing is the answer to that, uh, except that uh, uh, in about 1992, I guess, I was asked to chair a local committee of, um, to, to dr drum up interest really in the mighty 8th Air Force uh, Museum which they were trying to, uh, to, uh, to get built at the time. Now there was a national committee that did all the fundraising and uh, everything else that had to be done. Our job was simply to talk to civic clubs and uh, as many people as we could to get people locally interested in having that museum here. To do that, uh, I wanted to put together, to, together a slide presentation, um, and um, you know, uh, to use at these civic clubs. And I asked Archie Whitfield, who was a dear friend at the newspaper, to run a little article in City Beat, asking for people who had photographs of Savannah during World War II to please let me have those so that I could copy them and, and use in the slide project. Uh, programs. This very nice lady named Ethel Finnegan called me, uh, Evelyn Finnegan, excuse me, and said, I have a frame set of six photographs of my mother christening a Liberty ship at the shipyard. Uh, also within that frame was the very compressed ribbon from the bottle of champagne that uh, was used to, to christen the ship. It was just a fascinating thing to see. And that got me thinking, I was alive during World War II. I um, uh, was a child, but knew about the shipyard. Um, but since then, had totally forgotten it. I had driven out President Street and back in every day going to uh, work at Oatland. No thought for what had gone on on the riverside of, uh, of, of President uh, all those years ago. And what went on was huge. It was one of the biggest industries ever. In fact, the biggest industry that's ever operated in Savannah. More than 46,000 people 
worked out there during the 49 months that the shipyard was in existence. 15,000 at peak in December of 1943 in the three shifts that uh, were operating then. You know, in, in, in thinking about that, I thought, well, if, if I have forgotten, you know, about that yard, um, not a lot of other people my age would have forgotten it. A lot of people younger than I am would never have known that it ever existed. So that's what sort of got me thinking about it and got me, uh, um, you know, interested in, in doing um, just an aerial view of the yard and how big it was. Um, um, uh, up in the upper right hand corner there is Fig Island, which was kind of a problem at first because when they launched the first ship they weren't sure how far it was going to go back out into the water and whether it would run into Fig Island or not. And they attached great big huge concrete um, weights to it to drag it to a stop. Uh, it actually wasn't a problem and they never had to do that again. One of the other people that I interviewed very, very early um, was uh, a Captain uh, uh, Clifford Thomas. Clifford had been second mate, third mate on a number of Savannah Liberties during the war. He'd been captain of many of them uh, in peacetime after the war. And the person who, who told me about Clifford said uh, he knows an awful lot, but uh, he's very curmudgeonly, and you may have serious trouble with him. Um, I called him and he said, sure, I'd love to talk. I went out, had the greatest interview I think I had almost of, of all of them uh, for two hours, sat there talking about all kinds of things. It was just absolutely marvelous. Had a little small tape recorder that I was using, got home that night, turned it on and realized that I had not pushed the record button. <laughs> now, it took an awful lot of courage. <laughs> to call Clifford and say, look, um, uh, you were working with a total idiot there and, um, you know, uh, is it possible to do it again? He said, come out tomorrow night and we'll do it all over again. He was, he was really great and he, he continued to, to call and to write letters when I'd moved to Ireland, you know, about things that he had remembered, which, which made it really absolutely wonderful. All right, during the period that um, uh, the shipyard was open. It opened in, in, in 1942 uh, till towards the end of the war. It built 88 Liberty ships. Uh, Liberty ships were 441 feet long. Anyway, just to show you some of the crowd, that uh, was at one of the bond rallies, I think, uh, at, at the yard that was done very frequently. And uh, they raised a tremendous amount of money from the workers uh, for war bonds. Gives you an idea of what the shipyard looked like um, just before anything was built there, it was just mud and marsh. And they had to drive uh, 28,000 60-foot pine pilings into that area and then bring in 335,000 cubic yards of fill to, to build up a, a, a platform or a foundation that would uh, hold all of the other things that they were going to do there. You know, it's, it's, there was a movie a number of years ago um, uh, where the line, there was a line that said, if you build it, they will come. Um, and when they built this shipyard, they did come. Farmers came, leaving their wives and children in charge of their farms. Uh, automobile salesmen came because they had no more automobiles to sell during the war. Uh, professional athletes came, teachers, people from all walks of life came to, to work in the shipyard. Um, And it, the ships themselves, large enough to carry 2,840 jeeps, 300 light tanks, uh, millions of rounds of rifle ammunition. Uh, they weren't very pretty. Franklin Roosevelt called them ugly ducklings. Uh, I disagree. I think they were gorgeous ships. Uh, I think they had very, very beautiful lines. And uh, um, they didn't go very fast but uh, they did what they were supposed to do. Um, just some more pictures as I'm talking about uh, things there. Um, they had to be trained. There were, um, mo most of them came 
without any training at all. Savannah High had special classes. The Votec School had, had special classes. The shipyard itself had classes in welding and burning and ship fitting and all the other things that the skills that had to be uh, uh, used to build a, a ship of this size. Um, they had to be places for them to live. So Deptford Place, Tattnall Homes, uh, Moses Rogers Groves were all purposely built to, uh, to house shipyard workers. And uh, it, uh, it was it's sort of interesting in that, uh, in a description of Deptford Place, um, a newspaper reporter said, the Germans will never be able to find Deptford Place because the roofs had been camouflaged to blend in with the surroundings. And we, we sort of laugh at that and think, well, the Germans never got anywhere close. But in 1942 and 1943, we didn't know what the Germans could do. And the idea that uh, was passed about that they had long-range bombers, that they had aircraft carriers, uh, all of which could have reached the east coast of the United States. Uh, they didn't, but uh, uh, these were the kinds of things that were done. Uh, they didn't want shipyard workers uh, uh, bombed, uh, uh, you know, by the Germans. Um, as a side, uh, my job in my family's house was to make sure that blackout curtains were drawn every night uh, so that uh, light from the coal fires that we had in our, in our rooms uh, didn't get out and allow uh, either the bombers or uh, submarines off the coast to shell the city. Um, Women came to the yard. 13% of the, uh, the population of the shipyard uh, were women. That, that, let's go back a minute to that. That's um, Tattnall Homes. And I taught at my first teaching job was at um, Penn Avenue School. Penn Avenue was built specifically for the children of shipyard workers. I had no idea that that was the case. Um, sort of a strange situation. I didn't have an automobile in those days and rode to work with uh, two of the women teachers who lived downtown. And in the community center at Tattnall Homes, I had to attend an awful lot of Tupperware parties uh, <laughs> before I could get home. So, um, you know, it was a, <laughs> a very uh, interesting situation. I don't think I ever bought any Tupperware, though. Uh. Anyway, 13% um, were, uh, were women. It's Nan Hyatt and Bertha Brown who were welders at the yard, and they're waiting for their ride to work. They're standing on the corner of, uh, of Drayton and 37th Street. Um, just, a, a, again, an example of, of what they wore and uh, uh, the fact that, again, they were trained as welders and did the same jobs that, that men did. It wasn't the first time that women had gone to work in defense plants. They'd done that in World War I as well. But uh, the media wasn't available to talk about Wendy the Welder and Rosie the Riveter and that sort of business, uh, uh, you know, um, in World War I. Uh, all of that was done to promote uh, employments at the various defense plants and to raise morale. Um, blacks also came to work at the yard. African Americans did. Um, but uh, theirs was a very different situation. This is a cartoon from the Sow Easter, which was uh, uh, the in-house publication uh, for the shipyard. Uh, Sam Williams, who was one of the people that I interviewed, uh, and one of the few people that I interviewed that did not have good memories of the shipyard. When he applied, he had already been a diesel mechanic in peacetime life. Um, he wrote down on his application, diesel mechanic. It was torn up in front of him thrown away, he was handed another application and told, you put laborer down on that application. African Americans were hired only to clean and to carry. They were never allowed to, uh, to apply or train for any of the skilled positions in the shipyard. Um, it, it was something that some 50 years later, Sam Williams was still extremely bitter about. But all of these people, the women, the men, uh, African Americans all built ships. And they built ships in spite of 100 degree heat in the summertime. But working in all of that steel, working inside the hulls of those ships, if it was 100 degrees outside, you can imagine what it must have been inside of those ships. In the wintertime, it was freezing. You couldn't touch any steel with your bare hands because it would freeze to the steel. 
if you've ever lived on that side of town along the river, anywhere in that area, you know that uh, it's absolute heaven for deer flies, mosquitoes, and gnats. And uh, all of this they had to endure, but they did, and they built ships. Now, we were lucky in that we started the shipyard here a bit before the, the Jones shipyard in Brunswick started, so we got all the good names, all the good Georgian names for our ships. The first one, the James Oglethorpe. That wasn't going to come to this shipyard. Uh, the Maritime Commission decided that that was going to go to a shipyard in Houston, Texas. Can you imagine how many people in Houston, Texas knew who James Oglethorpe was? How many people today in Houston, Texas would know who James Oglethorpe was? Uh, the mayor at that time, with uh, help from uh, state and, and national officials, uh, campaigned to get that changed, and, and then we were given the name of uh, James Oglethorpe. But Habersham, Tattnall, Gwinnett, Pulaski, Toombs, Whitfield, all of those were names that uh, we were able to use on, on ships being built here in, in Savannah. Just to give you an idea of how hot it, it could be in that shipyard. Okay. Again, it's part of all of the problems. There was, it was an extremely dangerous job. A lot of people were injured. A number of people were killed working at the shipyard. Uh, I never was able to find out how many people were killed. That information generally was kept very secret. It wasn't something that they were going to publicize for a variety of reasons. And I never found any records at all indicating how many were killed. But um, almost everybody I talked to who worked at the yard said that they knew of a situation where somebody was killed. So I know that there were a number there, but uh, uh, I just have no idea really how, uh, how many uh, died there. Now, not only did uh, the workers come from uh, all over, those who sailed on the ships came from all over. Uh, this is a scene that would be familiar to most Savannians. Uh, on Wilmington Island, um, two of the people in there uh, are, um, um, gosh, William Fleetwood and his wife Adele. Um, William was, uh, Bill was the uh, purser on the Hoke Smith. The, two of the other people there are, um, uh, were the captain and his wife of that particular ship and they were here oh, a month or so before the ship was launched and stayed with the ship while it was being outfitted and so forth and so Bill and, and, and Adele invited them out for a crab boil on Wilmington Island. Uh, the fifth person sort of standing there is named Glass but I was never able to find out any more about him other than, than that. Ship being ready to, uh, for launch, it's called a hot ship. It meant that uh, when they got to the point where it was almost ready to be launched, um, everything stopped everywhere else. Everybody worked on that one ship to get it ready for, for launch day. This was a crowd that, uh, of workers' families who were invited for uh, one of the, the, the uh, launches. Uh, uh, 12,000 were invited. Approximately 15,000 showed up uh, that particular day. That pin is actually here tonight, uh, being worn by uh, Laura here, whose mom, uh, uh, Mrs. Spencer Conrad, uh, launched one of the ships. And they were given a big bouquet um, and that pin. It's a gold pin that has the name of the ship on the front and her name on the back of it. Uh, and each, each one of the uh, uh, maids or matrons of honor were, uh, were uh, given one of those pins. This is a Crawford Long. It's just been launched. The tugs are now moving it to the wet dock where it would be for a number of weeks uh, while everything else was, was put on the ship that uh, had to be put on. The guns were put on there. Uh, all of them were armed and they all had a Navy contingent on board. Uh, they were called the Naval Armed Guard um, in, in hopes of fighting off submarines or aircraft or whatever they might encounter. Uh, one actually did do that. Um, the James Jackson uh, who Clifford Thomas was third mate on, actually was involved in the sinking of a U-boat. So, uh, the Coast Guard, who took credit for the, for the sinking, um, uh, did not give uh, James Jackson much credit, but uh, Clifford was, was adamant that uh, they first sighted the U-boat 
It had been damaged by depth charges and, and rose to the surface. And they were the first to fire on it uh, with their stern gun. Now, there's some discrepancy. Um, the, uh, the Navy commander on board who was in charge of the gun crew said that he hit it on the uh, eighth shot. Clifford said he fired about 35 shots before he hit it. So. Uh, <laughs> So Liberty being loaded uh, in Savannah across the river, I think, uh, where the Trade Center is today. Um, many of the Savannah ships were loaded right here in Savannah with ammunition, with uh, tanks and guns and jeeps and whatever. All of them came in on trains. And I talked with somebody this morning who uh, actually watched those trains coming in and going down to uh, the port to uh, unload and then load those on to uh, the, the Liberty ships there. Um, they would go to New York after that, or another east port, eastern sea, uh, seaboard port, and deck cargoes would be loaded on. And the deck cargoes could be crates of ships, uh, of, excuse me, of airplanes, of tanks, and things like that. But they had very unusual cargoes, too. I have a photograph somewhere where one is carrying two tugboats on the deck. Another is carrying four uh, very large locomotives. Uh, seamen didn't want to sail on those ships because they were top heavy and uh, could cause uh, uh, serious problems. There again is another one, I think, at the Central Georgia docks uh, in Savannah. And if you look closely, it has mule stalls all along the deck there. Uh, mules were used extensively in the Italian campaign and in Burma. Um, and uh, it was sort of a funny regulation that the government had. You could carry troops and ammunition in the same ship. But you could not carry horses or mules and ammunition in the same ship. Now, I don't know whether they valued horses and mules more than the troops or not, but uh, that, that was a, a, a regulation of the time. A new Liberty uh, that obviously has not been loaded yet, but in the Savannah River. And uh, I think that is the James Jackson in convoy, actually, uh, in 1944, I believe. That's a photograph I took in 1992. Um, they, towards the end of the war, everybody realized that uh, you know, there, there would not be many more contracts for Liberty ships or for the AV-1s that they built. These were smaller ships that uh, were des destined for the Pacific because they had a shallow draft and could get in closer to some of the Pacific Islands. Um, they w workers were urged to, to work very hard to make sure that uh, the government would give them peacetime contracts. Uh, when, the, uh, when the war ended, those peacetime contracts never appeared. Um, the shipyard actually went out of business uh, within weeks after VJ Day. Uh, women were the first to be laid off. Um, African Americans were a little luckier in that they still needed to be there to clean and carry and do whatever. But eventually, everybody finally was laid off and the yard closed. Um, the um, city bought it. The idea of being a huge industrial site there, everything already there. There were railroad rails, tracks, and everything that was, was there that you might need for a big industrial uh, area. Nobody ever came. And in 1992, I took that photograph uh, from a, a dock that had a walkway out into the river where you could look back up onto the property. And that's what the ways looked like. Uh, the, the pilings had, had rotted down to the water level. The ways were twisted and broken up. And if you didn't know what you were looking at, you, you would, would have no idea that there was ever a shipyard there. Um, it was a very, very sort of sad situation. The ships themselves at the end of the war um, some were sold for peacetime use. Um, a Liberty ship in Savannah cost about $2,500,000 to build. They were sold off to shipping companies for about $50,000 apiece. Aristotle Onassis got his start in the shipping business by uh, buying a number of Liberty ships and using those uh, until he'd made enough money to buy bigger and faster ships. Um, many went into the reserve fleets. They were concerned that there would be um, another war soon, of course there was with the Korean War, and that those ships would be needed again. At the beginning of the, of the Second World War, this country was very unprepared. The merchant uh, fleet was 
was just as unprepared as anybody else. Uh, we had very, very few ships left from uh, the World War I period, and uh, so they wanted to keep these ships for a while in reserve fleets in case they could be uh, used again. Eventually, they were all scrapped. One actually was uh, um, taken out of one of the reserve fleets, was remodeled to use in another war. Its superstructure was uh, taken off. It was filled with styrofoam. And there were six outboard inboard motors placed along one side. And the idea was that uh, it would be moved sideways down a river in Vietnam and explode whatever mines might be there. Now, it sounds kind of weird. And I don't know whether good sense prevailed or our involvement in Vietnam ended before they were able to ever use this ship. Uh, it never made it to Vietnam, but uh, uh, did uh, uh, was, was eventually again scrapped. Um, a lot of these ships sailed to the mid-70s. Um, uh, they're all gone today. One came home. One is, is not very far away from us, but most of you would probably never get a chance to see it. The Addie Bagley Daniels was sunk 16 miles off of St. Catharines Island as a fish reef. And uh, I think I do have a photograph of that, so uh, we'll go to that. There, that. That's the ship being scuttled at that point. Um, so the shipyard's gone. The ships are gone. Most of the people who worked at the shipyard are gone. But they all ought to be remembered. They're people that we all knew. We worked with, we socialized with, we sat next to in churches and synagogues, uh, but never knew this particular part of their lives. In my own personal story, uh, personal life, um, there were people that I worked with and had no clue that they had ever done this sort of thing. There's a woman named Ruby Clifton who was a welder at the shipyard. She saved all the money that she earned there, and when her husband Pete got out of the army at the end of the war, um, they started Steel Erectors Company on the west side, very, very successful company. Well, Pete was president of the Boosters Club at Groves when I was uh, coaching baseball there. Um, he was instrumental in building the west side stadium. Uh, both of them were very active in affairs at the school, and I worked with them many, many, many times and had no idea that Ruby had ever been a welder there. Emma Kelly, the lady of 6,000 uh, 6, songs, was a welder at the shipyard. Unfortunately, she died before I found that out, and I never got a chance to, to talk with her. Walter Simmons was the principal at Hodge Elementary, an African-American who had a good experience at the shipyard. He was 16 years old, had just gotten his driver's license, and his job was, to, was working with the cafeteria. He would drive pickup trucks with the women who would serve the food in the canteens and the food down to those canteens in the work areas. And uh, as they would drive down there, all the men would whistle at the women, and uh, he just had a ball. He was, he was being able to drive all day long, everywhere. At 16 years old, uh, uh, you understand uh, an opportunity to, to, to drive like that uh, wherever you wanted to there was, uh, was a great thing for him. I worked with, uh, with him many, many years, had no idea that he'd ever worked at the shipyard. Uh, Henry Applewhite was mentioned a little earlier. I have two experiences with Henry. Um, uh, well, actually, it's just one, but I, I, again, I didn't know that he'd worked there. He was the, the band director at Savannah High, and in, when I was at uh, Washington Avenue Junior High, there was a drum and bugle corps, and he was director of that. Well, I was uh, uh, a bugler in the drum and bugle corps, and uh, it just shows how long-suffering Henry Applewhite was. Uh, <laughs> doing all of that. Uh, again, I had no idea that he'd ever worked at the shipyard. That's Shorty Beasley. Uh, he's another one of the people that I worked with uh, years later. Uh, interesting character, and I'll, I'll just take a minute and tell you about Shorty. When the war started, Shorty applied to join the Air Force. Uh, he wanted to be the tail gunner in a B-17. He figured that since he was so small that he would fit very well into that very tight space. And they told him no, that uh, he was too short to, to join the Army, and uh, told him to come back to Savannah and build ships, and that's what he did. Well, right before the end of the war, Shorty began to realize that the shipyard wasn't going to last forever. He left and went to work for Sears Roebuck. And when Sears was out on, uh, was on Henry Street, I worked in the display department there, and Shorty was, was uh, um, manager of the shipping department, which was right next door. 
So I knew Shorty and talked with him all the time, but again had no idea that he'd worked at the shipyard. All of these people should be remembered. Um, there really isn't a monument to these people at the shipyard here today. Uh, the merchant seamen who sailed during the war should have a special monument. There was one once um, in Emmett Park, but it was taken down to, uh, to build the Vietnam War Memorial. The bronze plaques that were on that uh, monument are stored somewhere and could be put back up, uh, probably at very little expense, and, and, and should be put back up. More merchant seamen from Savannah, based on the size of the population of the city, were killed than uh, from any other seaport in the United States. So these people really ought to be remembered. And I think that uh, about, about 2003, I wrote an article um, uh, with Dorothy's help, actually, uh, uh, about the James Overthought for Savannah Magazine. Uh, several months later, the newspaper ran a similar story. And then a year, or a little bit more than that ago, uh, 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 Michael Jordan came out with, with his very fine DVD. Um, all of these things, and hopefully with the book, um, uh, we, can drain, we can drum up some interest in some memorial to these people. Uh, they should be remembered. Thank you very much.